not going to share it. If you pass the interview, you cannot keep it silent. You will just, just hey, I, I passed the interview. If you say, uh, if, you, if you really pass the uh, interview in the embassy to come over here, you're not going to be quiet. You're going to smile till your ears here, and then you're going to uh, tell everybody, your family, your friends, I passed the interview, I passed the embassy. I mean, I'm going to, to, to Norway. You're not going to say, that's impossible for me. So the desire to share any good news come naturally to anybody. Oh, I've got a new baby brother. Yes, I passed the exam. I am top three. I got a job. That's only now. If you read the Second Kings, I don't know if you have your Bibles. Next time you bring your Bibles, okay? Please. And your excuse today. In Second Kings chapter seven, verse nine. I'll just summarize to you the story. There were two lepers. Lepers in the Bible cannot stay with their family. They've got to stay outside the city. So now there was a siege in Israel. These two lepers were outside. And because there was a siege, because there was the Assyrian army that seized the, the city, nobody can go out and nobody can come in. Almost everybody has got no food to eat because the, the enemy soldiers are outside. Nobody can come out of the city, no one can come in. And so there was famine in the city. Now these two lepers were outside the city. Outside because they were lepers, they were unclean. They cannot be with anybody. And then they said, if we're going to stay here, we're going to die of starvation. But what if we go to the camp of the enemy and surrender ourselves? There is, a tendency, there is a possibility that they are going to give us food because we are prisoners of war. If we stay, if they're going to kill us when we surrender, we'll die anyway. If we stay here, we'll die. So what are we going to do? Are we going to stay here and die of starvation or surrender to the enemy? Maybe they will kill us, but probably they will be merciful to us. They will give us more than we will live. And so they decided to go there and surrender to the enemy. But when they went to the, to the enemy's camp, lo and behold, nobody was there. All the enemy were gone. Because that night the Lord caused a kind of confusion among them. And so they fled. And so what was left was a lot of jewelries, a lot of plunders. A lot of money, a lot of food. And so these two lepers were starving to death. Now they are going to eat. They ate a lot. And I saw you eating a lot tonight. <laughs> and they have all the plunders and everything they got. And then finally when they were so full, they said, we are not doing good. This is not good. They're in the city. They are starving. What we're going to do is to tell them. So these two lepers became ambassadors to reach out to others in the city where to find food. Imagine the things like that. One beggar telling the other beggar where to find food. Now you are blessed by God because of His mercies and His goodness and because of the abundance of the knowledge that you have in Him. You've got to share that or else you will have spiritual indigestion. Here is a quotation. The happiest person in the world is the one most involved in serving others. Do you believe in that? Yes. Um, there was a song that says, I'm in right, upright, up, downright, happy all the time. Are you happy all the time? Yes. No, that's impossible. Okay. Now, not so many of us wanted to do that, do we? But one thing is for sure, whatever happiness you have found in your life has come as a result of forgetting about self. Forget yourself. And reach out genuinely to help others. The person who is the most involved in serving self is always the most miserable. So if you are going to reverse that, we say the, the most miserable person in the world is the one most involved in serving self. It is the life of service only that the true happiness is found. Because you see, 
Once you devote on serving yourself, you just look at your own problem, your own difficulties. You don't even realize or look at others. And what it is, you don't realize that there are others who are more less fortunate than you are. Now there's a there's a study. Uh, this is not my uncle, but uh, obviously. But this is uh, Bernard Rimland, director of the Institute for Child Behavior Research. Rimland found that the happiest people are those who help others. Here is how the study was conducted. Each person, Dr. Rimland chose each person, and each person involved in the study was asked to list at least 10 people that he or she knew best and to label each straight person with a name there and label them whether they are happy or not happy. Then they were to go through the list again. So the first is to list 10 people. The second is to label them happy or not happy. The third column, they are going to go through a list again and label them selfish or unselfish. Now, the definition of unselfishness is this. Oh, when selfishness is this. A stable tendency to devote one's time and resources to one's own interest and welfare. And unwillingness to inconvenience oneself for others. It means you are unwilling to help others. It means selfishness. Now, in categorizing the results, Rimland found that all the people labeled happy, list of the names, happy or not, selfish or unselfish. And then Rimland found that all the people labeled and happy were also labeled unselfish. He wrote that those whose activities are devoted to bringing themselves happiness are far less likely to be happy than those whose efforts are devoted to making others happy, Rimland concluded that they are very happy. Now, Christians should be the happiest people in the world. And, and one major reason that can be true is that the genuine Christian is always thinking of others, reaching out to others, and thus losing sight. No, this is not a Christian. This is not a Christian. No, 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 no. This is not a Christian. But this is the others, others, that the Christian reaches out and puts a smile into his face. What do you say? Can you say amen to that? Amen. Whosoever, Mark 8, 35, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. It's the opposite, isn't it? But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. It's a paradox. And this reaching out to others is like inevitably brings blessing upon the one who does the reaching out. Now, to give is to gain. I'll let you, I'll have you, there's a legend, before I sit down. There's a legend that was told concerning Jesus' return to heaven. This is only a legend, this is only a story. And as Gabriel welcomed the Son of God back to heaven, some 2,000 years ago, Gabriel asked, How will your good news be spread on earth, Lord? Did you leave a strong organization on earth? That was the question. Were there some well-defined plans for letting the people you love know that you died for them? No, Jesus replied. I left no organization, only a small company of disabled. He was referring to his disciples. But what if they fail, Lord Jesus? Gabriel asked. What plans do you have then? Jesus replied, I have no other plan. The story is a legend, but the truth is inescapable. Jesus chose not the heavenly angels to finish his work. He entrusted it to us, to me and to you. He trusted it to human beings. Jesus trusted it to us. That's the word, trust. In fact, if you read this in Christian service, page 7, ask his representatives among men. God does not chose angels who have never fallen, but human beings, men of like passions, with those they seek to save. 
You are my witnesses, Jesus said. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. Now, the Aramis Titanic.